all of you came here and some of you uh, did extremely well job most of you and all of you did put in your best fit forward let's see how we go and rework your presentations all along so that's something we'll be working throughout the day isn't it that this statement is so very relating to all of us i leave it for you to introspect by the way he is known as jesse sometimes a famed uh, american actor turned musician and he doubled into many other aspect of life as well at the end of the year uh, life's uh, years he was possibly one of the finest entrepreneurs as well so quite interesting statement i found it that at the moment you bring the presenter upon the podium it possibly when the heart starts beating the fastest uh catechol minds uh, come out the most and in one of the surveys it was found that uh, out of a list of 10 most dreaded fears of human being one of the most top rated fear was the fear of public speaking if i am not mistaken that was rank number 2 no wonder that is do you feel the same way any other thoughts comments many a time and most of the time the moment we come in front of the audience we feel that goosebumps however season that one might be so what we'll do over the next uh, hour or so we'll learn certain frameworks and i love frameworks personally very well in the sense that they really give you certain generic models which you can apply in any other work of life whether it is a professional presentation whether it is a public speaking whether it is uh, a personal uh, uh, speaking opportunity at home or society or wherever you are so we'll got to see what we call the 3s framework of presentation so how do you begin and how do you effectively conclude your presentations we'll look into through what we call the 3s framework of your effective presentations we'll see the art of story trailing though that's itself is a day long program that we can possibly run but it's increasingly getting uh, more embedded into overall communication strategy whether it's a business leader whether an academician whether a practitioner like yours the art of storytelling is so much riveting and compelling because every one of us deep within our heart are human being at the first we relate to the stories possibly that's the reason we remember still when are grown up the old stories by our nannies and grannies don't we so we'll see how the art of storytelling in possibly a serious topic and arena such as yours you can bring in succinctly the art of storytelling we'll see the fundamentals of communication there are established and well regarded rules of basic fundamentals uh, of communication and then we'll see what are some of the technique you possibly can involve employ in connecting with your audience what does this mean to you this is a very popular brand by the way i'll tell a story here uh the founder ceo of starbucks howard skulge was recently interviewed and in his interview to cnn he never spoke and uttered the word called coffee over next 35 minutes and at the end of the day the interviewer got so much intrigued and asked you sell coffees don't you and he said yes that's the most evident and obvious part of it what we sell is an experience we call it the third place between home and office what's the message here what's the message here the message is loud that you are creating a strong connect on a personal level with your stakeholders your customers if you look into this visual it's all about cisco the largest router provider of the world 
But their catch line never talks about routers and technologies. They talk about human connections. If you look into this, one of the most iconic brand of our time, the founder Steve Jobs never spoke about is personal computing. Never he spoke about. He talked about unleashing human potentials. And if I now talk about this, what is this? You might take a guess and I will uh, request a couple of responses from you. What does this uh, signify to you? Which company can you think about? I deliberately chosen not to highlight the name here first, unlike the previous three. Any guess? By the way, both of you can also make some educated guess here. Most likely you will think about some customer centric service organizations, some fast moving consumer goods, but hold your breath. This is your own fraternity Mayo Clinic talking. Recently, they unveiled a campaign called EUA. It's a campaign to raise a massive $3 billion fund from its patient group, some of the peer networking group, and its patrons. All these four have got a common story to tell to you. They're not speaking about the evident and the obvious. They're building a strong case for promoting their cause, be it the cause of routers, selling coffee, or Mayo Clinic's successful completion of so many years of healthcare to the world, they are telling a compelling story through their campaigns, which are very unique from rest of the packs. Each one of us and each one of you, at one point in time, do sell our own version of stories, don't we? If you have uh, pioneered a particular technique of surgery or a particular technique of anesthesia practice, won't you be inclined to sell that to the rest of the world? Surely you will be. So you will be immediately encouraged to sell your version of the story. This workshop was intended to equip you with some of the techniques and tools how to tell that compelling narrative or story. Are all of we agreeing to this? You don't have to necessarily agree. Please feel free to disagree. As long as we agree to disagree, I'm okay. Was a tacit submission. <laughs> anyway. So all of us, at one point in time, make a compelling pitch about our own services, our own expertise, our own products. So never uh, get shy of that. The moment you are put up onto the stage to speak at an anesthesia congress or for that matter any seminar, you are not selling a story. You are selling a story. You are telling the audience your version of the narrative. And that's what we are going to look into about hows and the techniques. Let me ask a question. I'll be asking a lot of questions, by the way, next 45 minutes. But I must res get some responses from you as well. So according to you, when you came or enrolled for this program today, what are the thoughts that came to your mind? Why should you sit in a presentation skills workshop? Doctor? Can we have the mics, please? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, my problem with presentations were the flow of words, actually. Uh, whenever I add the content of presentation was too huge, and the content was too deep, the flow of words was not that great. 
so how do i improve the presentation of uh, depth in depth subject when i presenting and that is what i want to you know but uh, the way you are putting things So I am being uh, told that if you don't have your names here and when you are attending please get your names registered with doctor so that you can get your uh, certificate of completion uh, by the committee. Yes, doctor. I, I think uh, that's a very valid uh, expectation sitting okay. for this. And I just came to learn about how to improve my flow of words in presentation. How do I better communicate with the audience? Mm -hmm. And uh, the problem is when I am presenting in a deeper planes of subject, mm -hmm. I may not be able to remember the subject in detail at that time of presentation. So that words will go off and I will fumble a little bit. So is it a problem with my learning the subject in depth or the problem with the presentation? Okay, before I actually go into what uh, could be the reason which we can talk one on one, okay. but definitely I do admire the candidness with which you spoke about your expectations. I mean, do appreciate. I mean, making yourself uh, open in front of uh, your peers takes courage and I do admire for that. Thank you. So how, how do you think uh, when did you when you enrolled for this program what thoughts came to your mind? Why should you at the end of uh, the day attend after having attended certain degree of success, fame, authority within your own profession? Why should you sit for a presentation skill workshop by the way? Uh, I think uh, whether you are working in a medical college mm -hmm. or you are working in a private hospital, corporate hospital, uh, your presentation of a particular topic does uh, signify who you are, basically. Even if you have pretty good knowledge of this subject, you might find it very difficult at times to convey it to an audience. So that communication is something which uh, you need to develop on unless you have it inherently in you. It's something that you need to develop. It. And it becomes all the more important if you are working in a corporate setup where in addition to the uh, medical aspects, you might have to make presentations towards the management on um, other aspects of the sure. healthcare. So uh, you should be able to convince the management regarding your needs. And for that, you should have an effective presentation skill couldn't have agreed more possibly. Everybody who sees me present things, I'm very, a very confident presenter. Only I know the tension I go through. My knees start shivering every time I go in front. And there have been so many episodes of forgetting your presentation, forgetting what to... As an ex-tempo speaker, I've gone, I've gone blank and I've come back also. So without a PPD, I can never do a presentation. So. And Dr. Poonam, counting yourself among the hordes of people. You are not alone. Yeah. Most of us, when we go up on the dais, we have similar symptoms. Because so you are not time, alone. Yeah. There are a huge number of people or a majority of us fall in that lake. How would I, how would I improve myself? I mean, being a little more confident probably, the jittery knees would they'll feel a little better. <laughs> So, possibly I can't recommend you a beta blocker, <laughs> however, <at laughs> that does work. Yeah, some more thoughts, if you are willing, yeah, please. I mean, everybody communicates, right? What is that communication that brings into the crowd? Everybody present, but what is that presentation that gives that message that you will remember it life now? That's where I think I wanted to. And two being, uh, you know, you have a lot of content, but you have to put in that given time. And how to put the, it's an like effective presentation. Alright. Good. Fair enough. Fair expected. Yeah, you want to share? Oh, I am loving it now. People are now coming up. Yeah. Uh, 
my concern is like uh, we are working in the busy schedule and when we want to present make a presentation mm -hmm. uh, we don't have that much time actually uh, we may have a knowledge and uh, we may have a data and we know we may know uh, what to uh, means what should be there but uh, because i think uh, we are not knowing how to make the presentation and uh, we are um, therefore uh, it is that is more time consuming and therefore then it doesn't happen that well i think for my side fair enough so let's see how does a great presentation look like when we have spoken about that these are some of the qualities i'm not reading this by the way i i left it for a couple of minutes for you to reflect back and if anything that strikes you the most which is something that you got a revelation about having gone through these characteristics please do share i strongly encourage you if something that you found is quite riveting quite revealing for you please have a look into that yeah you want to make comments yeah please on that engaging mind and art okay uh, that Uh, it doesn't it's not easy to get that engaging of mind and art actually whenever you are presenting if you want that to be true i think you need to make some in between jokes and involve everybody their attention towards you whenever there is a difficult uh, aspect of presentation is there at that time that difficult topic should be converted to a uh, casual joking session and giving an example probably that will improve the grasping and understanding of the audience i think that is one thing uh, you can improve on mind and all the things dr reddy i agree to with you partly why is it partly okay when you use certain degree of humor i will not call it jokes when you talk about communication or presentation you talk about the element of humor uh it, it has to be very subtly played out because the humor has the potential to ensure kind of thing it has double aged it might cu cut either way it might put some uh, of the presentation uh, i mean uh, audiences put off but most often than not it lifts up the spirit of majority of us so you have to be very subtle you must know you should scan the environment in the sense of what kind of audience i'm presenting to what is the kind of content that i'm presenting with and based on that you might wish to bring in the element of humor into that but yes i strongly believe and in the morning as you might have heard me speaking at the end of the day we are all human beings so we connect with a little bit of stretching our smiles at the end of the day it takes lesser number of muscles to do that rather than frowning on don't we so yes you have got a valid point thanks for bringing that up anyone would like to find something which you found quite riveting quite revealing ha huh? understand what's a compelling and narrative compelling narrative it as a good talk yeah so right that's a great point yeah you'd like to uh, respond to this so uh, yeah that's that's a valid point and to answer to your question uh, dr manju compelling narrative is nothing but making on telling a story i was talking through a couple of slides back when the ceo of starbucks talks about selling an experience for all of us as a third experience or third place between home and office he is not selling latte he is not selling cappuccino by the way but he's selling he is selling an experience other than home and office so this is a his part of compelling narrative trust that clarifies how about this because i deliberately coming to this because why i f why i i f m is something which is a communication language not necessarily your medical diction it's it 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 it's an acronym for what's in it for me so when you are speaking to a group of audience all of you currently when i came on here for the first time all if you have one question lingering in your mind 
What's in it for me sitting through this whole day? Every one of us from that side of the table always and very validly ask this question, what's in it for me? As a presenter, if I don't talk about your expectations, what's in it for them, YIFT, I have not successfully communicated with you. So when you, some of you, ex expressed your expectation of the day as to gain some techniques, some tools, how to make a compelling presentation, that's an YIFT for me, as opposed to YIIFM for you, which is nothing but what's in it for me. Why should I care about this one day session? How about this? Yes, sometimes we are spellbound with great presenters, don't we? How many of you have seen 2005? iPhone launch by Steve Jobs. Sir, let me ask you a question. What moment in that video, if you have seen through over YouTube most likely? Yeah, so, so. Yeah. Similarly, Steve Jobs throughout his presentation, he never spoke about the iPhone. iPhone first generation phone. And only in the last moments did he take it out from his pocket, or I don't know, from pocket or from the table, and he showed it to the audience. And it, uh, he had that thing, to us, uh, he had told his videographer that it should be his face should, and the 10, 10 moment. That means it, when it is 10 a.m., 10 minutes, it should, he will take it out and show it to the audience, and it should be, clicked and in the phone also that 1010 that's why it is always 1010 in the apple uh, phone uh, advertisement mm -hmm. the time shown will always be 1010 mm -hmm. because he had seen to it and he was very particular that it will be during that moment only he will take it out and present it to the audience that is to the world okay good great insights i think so yes one of the finest speakers or presenters or communicators in the corporate world we have seen so far was Steve Jobs. He, he, he used to actually play a snake charmer. You know snake charmers, how do they so-called charm the snakes through whatever the, we know all the science behind that because here uh, snakes can't hear by the way. It only re reacts to the striking pose by the flirt or the snake charmer. But yes, he used to play the role of a successful snake charmer for his audiences. And one of the things that he used to perfectly do is to bring those jaw-dropping moments. When he first unveiled iPhone for the first time in that tech conference, he never before that moment, as you have rightly mentioned, brought in this topic of iPhone. He spoke about what are the current evils of existing phones what are some of the drawbacks of the current existing phones? What he essentially did, he made a villain out of those shortcomings of existing phones. And then he introduced a hero. Incidentally, this hero was later to be called iPhone. And that was the jaw-dropping moment for all of us. As, and this is rated as one of the finest speeches. If you go into Stanford's commemorating uh, closer, when he speaks to a group of passing out grads from Stanford uh, University. I would strongly recommend you go and watch this video on YouTube. It's again a spellbound moment. So he used to perfectly magically create those jaw-dropping moments. What essentially means this will be spellbound moments. In fact, for a couple of presentations sitting through this morning, I, I had that moment seeing through that. Specifically those humors and those kind of things. I really connected, yes, this is what I believe about the relationship between surgeons and anesthetists in India. Because you nicely could put those through visuals which really captured and triggered thoughts in my mind. Those were my jaw-dropping moments by the way sitting through this morning. So, uh, review those characteristics sometimes because this presentation is anyway going to be with you later on as part of a PDF document, which the committee will send to all of you. 
So, some of you have started presenting to your teachers, your Congress uh, audience, and some of you have already achieved that veteran status. So, what do you think are your strengths of presentations? Feel free come in any random order. What do you think your strengths are? Yeah, please. I do a good groundwork. I do plenty of research before I present a topic. Mm -hmm. That helps me a lot. And I do practice my presentations. Indeed. Prior. Great. Any more thoughts? Yeah. The same way I like to practice. I have to include the contents in the precise, precisely. And uh, put the highlights by some magic works. Like some, as you said, some jokes or cartoons that yeah. that be remembered by the audience at the end of the session. Very true. Nice blend of your own anecdotes and stories and experiences with evidences, which are hard facts. So bringing in some soft element into that. How nice about that? Great. What I think uh, before presentation is. I always think what uh, audience will expect from the presentation, mm -hmm. what they will take, what the message they will take from the presentation. I always uh, think about it. So you are essentially addressing. W I F whatever you told. You got it right. Yeah, great. I generally think about uh, giving more content to the audience. Actually, uh -huh. I don't know whether it's true or not because how much they will be grasping. I try to put a lot of material into my presentation. I try to make them understand a lot of things, but it is a negative side or positive side, I'm not sure. Uh, there is a great uh, role of balance in our life. I mean, I, I will say only that, uh, because I'm not an expert about your topic, so naturally I'll not comment about the depth, but you need to have a nice semblance of parity between the breadth and the depth of your presentation. It, it shouldn't be too deep, with your audience, neither it should be too shallow. So, yeah, you make your own judgment, your own experience, your feedback. More importantly, taking feedback for some of your friends who are sitting in the audience at times would be a good indicator for you. Yes. So, we have our own strengths and some of you seem to be a little conservative in saying that. How about you, sir? Deepak? I I'm sure all of you can actually go a little inward, introspect what your strengths are. It's a good beginning point, a good, good starting point to gain that mastery that you all of you want to achieve. To look inward, take certain outward feedback as well at times and then look into what are your distinct strength, what is your distinct trait as a presenter, and try to build on that. We talked about, we'll go through this framework, right? 3S framework. So it all begins with the end in mind. It all begins with the end in mind. So you have a strategy, so to say, for any presentation. You have got a roadmap, what you want to share over the next six minutes, next 45 minutes session in terms of your presentation. So you have a strategy in mind, right? All of you have a strategy. When you came to present your six minutes uh, presentation on the given topic, you might have thought through several times. Even if you have received that mail two days back, even, you have thought through what I'm going to talk about, how I'm going to look like. What kind of presentation material I will use? Why should I bring in some element of uh, uh, those graphics and visuals? You made a strategy. So that's the first part of any great presentation. You have a strategy for the presentation. You have a roadmap for the presentation. Second, around that strategy and supporting that strategy, what you have, you have something called scenario building. You, you start creating a landscape. Sir, you do gardening. You have uh, some odd number of trees in your orchard. 
So you have those, so you create certain landscaping around that on the Sundays, right? I'm sure you must be doing. So as a gardener, you actually create a landscape. Similarly, as a presenter, you build a scenario around the theme, be it a, a new experiment with some of the new anesthetic drugs that you might be using. You start building up a story. What kind of patient population I was looking at? What kind of current challenges that I faced with earlier medicines? And how do you think that with the use of this new drug, I'm going to improve patient outcomes? So you have got a clear strategy. You start building up a presentation. And then you start building up a story about certain number of N cohort kind of thing. And then you adopt a very distinctive style, which is your very own style and never be a second rated copy of someone else. You distinctly try and develop your own style which is very much unique you. Because no one else can copy your style by the way. And even if they copy it, that will be second class copy. It will never be first rated. So why not develop your own style? So these are three compelling uh, pillars of any great presentation. It starts with the end in mind, tell your version of the compelling narrative or the story and when it comes to style, one golden rule, present to inspire others, not to impress. More often we try to do the other way around, we want to impress and play the hardball with our audiences, that doesn't simply work. If you try to inspire your audience to a certain goal, to inspire them to take certain action, Everyone has do some kind of say presentation to inspire someone else to do certain correct action, right? That's the basic goal. If I ask you what is the basic goal of any presentation or communication, to me it all means to inspire someone else to take certain action that I want them to. So in that sense, your style should be one of inspiring your audience, not impressing your audience. Do you find this is making sense here? Sometimes I think. Yeah, please. For a period of time when I'm looking through my PowerPoint presentation, I just feel they all look like the same. I think I sell in the same kind of, whatever, let's say, making a scene. So now I think a little more, and I think I do kind of change. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that goes very well with 3S because. You are not, so what's your kind concerns? You want to make certain... Like it's not about the other, it's not about improving the It's not impressing at all, yeah. I don't want to be a bad stuck, I want to go on improving. Oh yeah, and when you improve yourself in terms of an effective delivery of a presentation, you are going to inspire the generations which are going to come. You are no way impressing people. That's an act of inspiring others with your ideas, your experience, and your clinical findings. So I, I see that really that your aspiration of yours actually support this last S. You are, you are so enthused, energized to inspire others with your ideas, your evidences, your clinical findings. And that's perfectly okay. It's no way is impressing. It's rather inspiring. Let's see one, each one of this is individually. Can I request not to cross over? Yeah? So when you talk about the first S, we begin with strategy. You have got, again, three distinct P coming into this. Again, I uh, talked about frameworks. Frameworks are a nice tool to remember things. So when you have a strategy, you have got three P's. And these are nothing but, you have a purpose. Why should you present something that you intend to? Some of you or most of you chose today medical tourism. So you might have thought certain purpose. Why, why medical tourism and why not the rest of the five? So you had a certain purpose. So every presentation begins with purpose. You might have thought while preparing, what kind of audience would I get? Will they be senior to me? Would they be peer group to me? How are these facilitators going to behave? 
all thoughts might have come up to your mind. So that's nothing but scanning about the people part of it. And the third P is where you are going to present, which place, what kind of format you are going to present. Is it going to be a theater style, a cluster sitting like this? Would the room size be bigger enough, well lit? What kind of audio will be there? All thoughts would have come into mind. Yesterday I came over specifically here yesterday to, take, uh, to do a kind of recce to see what kind of facilities I am getting. This morning I came almost uh, one and a half hours before the session was to begin. All to ensure that I have got no last minute surprises but still there is someone called Murphy. Mr. Murphy, Mr. Murphy's rule always catches you up. When you expect the thing go the list, they occur the most. <laughs> and that's an interesting finding. Some of the things were not working this morning. Thankfully, I came in, showed up a little early so I could look into those. So yes, so you uh, scan about this 3P as part of your strategy. Let's look into this. We have spoken about this. You have got certain expectation from this one day long sitting through here. You could have done better job possibly by sitting into the other hallway where possibly some clinical evidence is being shared. But you chose not to do and instead sit here. So you had certain kind of expectation from me and you were actually tuning into not 98.3 FM radio station, you were tuning into something called YIFM. What's in it for me? And as a presenter, if I don't bother about your YIFM and match that with something called YIFT, I am failure. So to balance between the audience's expectations with my delivery is something that makes or breaks a presentation. Here is a fundamental principle of advertisement. So I'm taking into some of the rules of marketing. It all begins with attention, interest, desire and so that the customer can take certain action in terms of losing the purse, right? Losing the strings of the purse so that he or she can actually purchase certain things. That's the fundamental principle of any advertisement. In presentation, we add an element of C, A-I-D-C-A, which nothing is, as a presenter, did I generate enough conviction in my audience? about what I said here. If I have taken well care of this part of C, I am done. If not, go back to the drawing board, do your homework well. So we call it building that conviction in your audience and that's all about that part. We present to inspire the audience, not to impress. Am I communicating here? At the end of the day, it's all about you. If I haven't taken and scanned my audience as well, your unique needs, expectations of sitting through this one day workshop, I am a failure. If I have taken well care of that, possibly my presentation will stick for some time, even if you move out of this room. When I look into audience, I actually profile my audience on these five parameters. I, I try to gauge their interest level. So basically, a couple of questions that I asked Dr. Bala when we met for the first conceptualization. Who will be my audience? What kind of mix of senior and other uh, participants mix would be? I asked all those questions about my audience. I tried to know a little more about my audience. What kind of background in presentation? I'm not going to uh, talk about your knowledge and your expertise in your domain. For the purpose that you are sitting through, what kind of knowledge or experience do they have? And then I was told that there would be a pretty senior faculty members who will be part of your audience. So that really helped me to chalk out certain strategy which other facilitators will be definitely using along with me. We try to do what kind of attitudes do they bring to the table, what kind of influence the audience themselves as peers have and what kind of traits do they show up. 
So what you essentially doing, you are trying to understand your audience while you are presenting anything in terms of doing an audience analysis on these parameters. As a presenter, you will always come more effective if you do uh, analysis of your audience first. Because at the end of the day, it's not about what you know just to sprig them out and come out. No. One of the finest medical speakers would definitely inspire many in the audience to take that first move in terms of initiating a new surgery techniques, diagnosing a particular pathological uh, conditions in a new fashion. So there will be always some kind of inspiration for the audience. And those kind of presentations linger in our memory for a long time, don't they? What kind of place that I'm going to present here? Can you uh, find, there will be a couple of visuals coming up on your scheme. So what kind of uh, thing is going on here? What, ki what kind of meeting is this? Sorry? It's a classroom, group meeting, that's an important thing, it's a group meeting, but more precisely it is something for generating ideas. So if you are generating some ideas from your peer group, other uh, anesthetists, and you would like to debate on a particular topic, you would like to form what you call brainstorming sessions. That essentially is a brainstorming, and the facilitator in the brainstorming adopts a particular style. But for this kind of, which is a very formal kind of meeting, the second visual, it's something most often we see in corporate worlds. There is some presenter talking about certain aspects of the company's performance, people performance and strategies of competitors and stuff like that. So people are presenting there. How about this? Video in, sorry? Video Video With the advent of telemedicine, so you are increasingly seeing this kind of practices. You are no longer good enough practicing medicine alone. You have to now equally good in adoption of technology in your aspect as well. And a couple of you do it well. I have seen many of you. In fact, uh, the other day Dr. Bala sent me a YouTube link of his presentation to one of the uh, Anesthesia Congress and asked me, why don't you give me a critical feedback? So it was almost 57 odd minutes video. I went through the whole 57 minutes and then I provided a couple of feedback to him. So adoption of technology is widespread in your world as well. So how comfortable are you using those technologies? Most often than not, in various national and international congresses, you adopt that format, which is nothing but seminar, where there is very little audience interaction. So in those 45 minutes, you want to make a presentation which goes deep inside their mind for a long time to be retained. So the format is very different in this format. And then you have mother of all presentation, the TED Talks. How many of you know about TED Talks? I'm, I'm sure many of you know and see regularly TED Talks. If not, since you are all so much interested in improving your own presentation skill, I strongly urge you, please go and view TED Talks. They are famous talks and not, if I aspire to give a TED talk, they will simply not allow me to go and speak. No, TED, that stands for Technology, Entertainment and Design. They are possibly regarded as the rigor of public speaking. I strongly encourage you to go and see those videos. You will pick out certain techniques and tips of great presentations there. Does this uh, visual seems familiar to you? Whose is this, by the way? Any ed educated guess? Sorry? Uh, coming very closer. Those three key names. You have spoken about two. The third one you are missing. You spoke about Socrates, hypocrites. You missed out Aristotle. Aristotle is often regarded as father of communication. And to him, telling a story was always paramount. 
he suggested three interesting pillars of any great communication. He talked about ethos, he talked about logos, and he talked about pathos. What does that mean? Ethos is nothing but the conviction, the authority, the credibility of the speaker. If Dr. Bala wouldn't have introduced us in the morning and all of a sudden we started beginning speaking to you, you have all the right to raise a question mark in your mind who they are. Why should I care about their presentations? Didn't, isn't that right? There has to be some kind of credibility when you go for any kind of seminar or Congress speaking. You look up to the speaker, you note down the agenda that I need to be present come what may out of the six sessions at least three of this I must not miss. Why do you think you do that? You do that because you have certain idea about the credibility of the speaker there. You don't want to miss. So that is it holds. And what you do well so much in your kind of presentation, you do lot of logos. Logos means logic, rational, data, evidence. Those are all but, those are all logos. And then some of the great presenters in medical uh, speech as well, they try to connect head as well as hurt. And they effectively tap to what we call pathos. Pathos is nothing but emotions. So Aristotle talked about that a fine balance between ethos, logos and pathos is what makes a great communication. And what I have shown here is based on a research done on these TED Talks. These TED Talks are again peerly reviewed and ticked up as the most watched talks. And out of those most watched talks, they analyzed for this component of ethos, logos and pathos. And then they came up that most of the effect, most effective speeches there, they had a long component of pathos. They had 25 odd, a quarter of the presentation was only devoted to logos. And only 10% was about ethos. So it's not me speaking, it's some of the finest authorities in the communication field speaking that one of the finest components of effective communication is appealing to the human element. Does that surprise you by the way? Does that surprise you? You would have thought that it is logos all alone. So if you are presenting evidences, tons of them, please try to balance it out nicely with some elements of pathos as well into that. I'll, I'll show a quick video here. Is the audio? Where is the audio? Us baat ka gate Baba Adam ke zawane. Ye main, ye Yusuf. Lamudia yar si mera. Lahore mein maare karke samne bada baat tha. Us baat ka gate Baba Adam ke zawane. Roz sham ko amne ma patenge udani. और उसके बाद जाके यीशु के दुकान से जजरिया चुरा के खानी जजरिया और मेरा साहब नमस्ते 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 मेरी पोती मुंबई वाली और बेटे क्या हाल चाल है Oh, 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 oh,
अपने की तंग गली फिर सकूद फांदे छोटी छोटी मीठी चोरी गांठ लेके बांधे हेलो अस्सलाम वालेकुम फजल स्वीट्स हां जी दादा जान दिल्ली से किसी की कॉल है हेलो यूसुफ अंकल कौन जी मैं सुमन बोल रही हूँ दिल्ली से आपके बचपन के दोस्त बलदेव जी की पोती याद है बचपन में आप दोनों जजरिया चुरा के खाते थे बचपन में की तंग गले फिर से कूद फांदे छोटी छोटी मिठी चोरी गांठ लेके बांधे एक पतंग सा उड़ता था परिंदों की तरह परिंदों की तरह परिंदों की तरह एक दौर था मन मन मोर था एक दौर था मन मन मोर था पार्टीशन के वक्त हम रातों रात हिंदुस्तान आ गए यूसुफ थी बड़ी आ जाती है कागजों के कश्तियों में डूब रहता था झांकती खिड़कियों में उलझा रहता था वो भी क्या दौर था मन पे न जोर था एक दौर था मन मन मोर था एक दौर था मन मन मोर था जी कौन हैप्पी बर्थडे यारा so it's not me say it's some authorities such as aristotle himself speaking about ethos pathos and logos i'm sure next time you are trying to build a presentation you'll bring in some element i understand your arena of presentation will be definitely evidence based but if you look into how or opportunities of where you build in those elements of this three ethos logos and pathos i'm sure your audience will very well connect with you right look into the presentation layout when if you look and categorize your own presentation which you will be uh, doing sometimes later you would have started with some kind of introduction if not please look into that how do you introduce the topics if you have taken the topics such as medical tourism all of you did what is medical tourism that's nothing but introduction you put in certain data even if that was research well researched that form the part of your body possibly i am not sure whether you concluded going forward what does it mean like the i mean uh, medical tourism in india some kind of conclusion so it has again three elements introduction body and conclusion and this is all and when you conclude you make uh, some provisions for interaction with the audience in form of if audiences have certain question and answers you would like to take certain queries you want to share your own expertise based on that query 
so you provision for those sessions as well so effective speakers will always take out some 5 to 10 minutes sorry 5 to 10 percent of time for audience interactions in introduction I don't need to name him who he is so some of you are already using the product so he used to make very compelling and riveting introductions what are some of the introduction style do you have what is your thought about introduction how do you do that how do you open the presentation think about that if you begin it's been statistically proven that if you can't hold your audience attention span in the initial 30 seconds you have lost the audience attention for rest of your sessions so what do you do to ensure that the initial 30 seconds you have the minds space of your audience towards your presentation you either gain that or you lose within the very first minute itself period some of the startling facts often as a communicator we do you begin your sessions with certain startling facts it could be anything it could be a clinical findings that you recently encountered and you thought that this is all a moment which I must share with my audience please bring that up on the order and speak to your audience it immediately funnels the attention of your audience so often I personally favor this technique of some startling facts so if I ask you in the beginning of the day when was the last when was the last time you did something for the first time Dr. Pooja wonders what did I say that was intentionally done because I wanted to begin my presentation with certain startling facts I asked a simple question when was the last time you did for the first time doesn't this simple sentence puts you into the thinking mode this is one way of effective introduction that works well for me devise and discover your own but if you haven't gained your audience's attention in the first 30 seconds or 45 seconds you have lost it for the rest of your presentation and more so in your kind of presentation where the gathering is of about say 200 300 odd people listening to your uh, clinical evidences sharing sessions it's all the more important to have that connect immediately find your own <sighs> this is where the narrative or the body comes in what what kind of story you are going to share with them what kind of flow you are going to have it how are they logically put together are they making a logical sense and flow are they too much cluttered so many facts and figures toppling over each other or they are nicely and neatly picked have you fragmented into session wise over the next 45 minutes we are going to review this clinical findings and we have distinctly divided that into two or three subtopics that's what you call fragmenting your presentation we do use bullet points to attract the attentions though there are critics about bullet points as well that's a topic later on you conclude profoundly what you want to convey the message with and please remember if I am using today slides there is something called I'm, I'm sure some of you know it there's something called death by PowerPoint please google this term death by PowerPoint because human species over the last uh, couple of decades ever since in 1987 Microsoft launched presentations tool known as PowerPoint it has so very much abused misused and overused if I have to announce my son's birthday I make a PowerPoint presentation and I've seen that literally 
how silly I could be. Possibly Bill Gates would have never thought about that his PowerPoints would be so much glorifiedly so-called quote-unquote used. There is distinctly term now known as death by PowerPoint. I personally feel slides should be up there to support your story. It's between you and the audience you are speaking. And many a times we see presenters present like this. So whom you are talking to? You are talking to the slides, ignoring your audience. So slides should be there as just a support tool. It shouldn't be the soul and body of your presentation. It's just there as a support tool. You conclude profoundly about summarizing. You summarize your key points. That's what the TV anchors, the interviewers do. They summarize well what the audience need to know about the whole communication. I find it extremely well that any presentation, any presentation, what kind of nature of the presentation it be, should inspire the audience to take certain action. If you have devised and discovered a certain way of doing an anesthesia using epidurals, why won't you like the others in the audience to experiment with the same technique and share the results? I'm sure inherently all of us are in some way look for that thing. Please inspire your audience to take certain actions based on your own presentations. Open for Q&A. And many a times your superordinate goals become so much compelling for the audience to take actions. So when the TV advertisement of a car manufacturer shows you how to fashion the seat belt, he's not selling his car, by the way. It is selling safe driving practice. So that is what you call appealing to the superordinate goals. And at times you need to dramatize. And who better does that than Steve Jobs? If you have seen that video, at one point in time, he actually takes a position like this to show the uh, iPhone. And it's a much publicized visual. Why do you think he did that in front of 4,000 odd audience? He dramatized the action. And he was a master communicator. What is your style? Though it should be your very unique style, but a couple of authorities in the field of communication, and he is regarded as one of those, Bob Pike, he devised an interesting observation, an empirical one, based on his own research of over the years and decades, and he talked about your presentation should be 90, 20, and 8. By the way, do someone of you teach medical students even? So I think this is specifically for you. As a teacher, you should remember this rule of 90, 20, and 8. It says, none of your sessions, none of your classes should go beyond 90 minutes without a formal break. That's the reason most often than not you will see the meeting starts at 9 and the first tea break happens at 10.30, precisely 90 minutes. No session should go beyond 90 minutes without a formal break. What about 20? Every 20 minutes you chunk your presentation into subtopics. And what about 8? You design your presentation in such a way that every 8 minutes you have the audience getting an opportunity to be involved. Means your students should get some kind of involvement every eight minutes. We call this the rule of 90, 20, and 8. Works pretty well in communication.
another number. So I thought since I will be speaking to a group of evidence-based professionals such as yours, let me speak about some numbers. Does this number signal anything to you and mean anything to you? Sorry? Number of audience. Time. Can I ask you to add up all this? I'm giving a hint now. They add up to what? They add up to 3. 7 thir plus 38 plus 55. They add up to a century. So it says, it's a general rule of communication. We think we should have glorified and heavy, bombasting English words <coughs> taken fresh from the pages of dictionary. We couldn't have been far from the truth. Only 7% of our communication are expressed through words, spoken words. And possibly we end up paying the highest focus there itself. Only 7% are communicated through verbal words. 38% of your communication happens through how you speak those words through use of vocals. When I talk about vocals, it means what kind of intonation, speech, pause, varying of my acoustics dimensions. That's your 38%. And more than half, that is 55%, are visuals. Means my gesture, my gait, my posture my eye contact, my facial expressions, my movement of hands, they add up to 55%. But unfortunately, we are so engrossed leaving out 55% often. That's all about communication. Only 7% are communicated through verbal words. So next time you are up there for any presentation, please be a little mindful about Rest 38% and 55%. And I'm not saying this. This is done by a professor of psychology in University College of Los Angeles, UCLA. He talked about, his name is Albert Mehrabian, Professor Albert Mehrabian. He spoke about this three, 7, 38, and 55% of communication. In non-verbal communication, I'd like to draw your attention to the obvious culprits such as eye contacts, often we are not having the comfortable eye contact. Or at times I have seen speakers who have got too much piercing eye contact to the extent of being uncomfortable to the audience and the rest of the audience. Many a times we don't make ourselves properly audible. Varying the pitch and tone of your voice, pace, I'm sure uh, when you go for presenting in any kind of congress where you have got say delegate size of say excess of thousand odd people, you have been asked by the uh, organizing committee secretary to now they will invite and the biggest blunder that we do, we walk up to the stage, make ourselves a solid cocoon behind this lectern which I call the villain of presentation. Yes, for most of the presenter, this becomes a surrogate. We get a comfortable cocoon behind this. Because the moment I come and in front of the audience, I am naked and bared. I personally, it's my feeling and that's where possibly me and Dr. Bala uh, debated a little more. But then I respect your own... Uh, world of communication, the way it is so far being done. But I would definitely love medical presenters moving beyond lecterns. I am absolutely a no-no for lecterns. You have technology, nice technology. I can play 
every slide do animation even right from the next hall why not use that and what do we do we, we get to say the presenter up on the uh, podium and immediately he starts blurting out all the data the biggest mistake my tip would be if you are there please use the power of silence for a couple of seconds preferably for 20 or 30 odd seconds or 15 seconds don't speak anything for next 15 seconds at least once you are up there on the stage what you are doing you are essentially creating a vacuum and when you are creating a vacuum it's deafening for the audience they start getting their attentions funneled to you because it will more often than not happen that you are preceded by a speaker and you will be succeeded by another speaker so unless you have created that vacuum in the minds of your audience you will be viewed a line extension of the earlier speaker and a precedent for the next speaker so please use the power of silence at times it's so powerful router for your audience attention pauses are excellent tools you shouldn't ram into sentences after sentences so that you have the audience thinking in time as well because you have spoken you have devised your presentation audience has haven't they take some time to download those information process those information and then appreciate or discard it so allow them some time by way of pausing and then many a times we have got speakers mm, mm, uh -huh, mm. what i'm doing i am filling my presentation with what we call feelers and this is a common problem of communication and there are some cultural aspects of presentation when you go abroad presenting to the international speakers and community you run a workshop by the way of a close group of your peers you have to take this part very much seriously cultural because our cultural milieu and ethos will suggest some way of interacting with your cusp with your uh, audiences but that could be very much very much <coughs> different from others having experience in almost all regions of the world I can for sure I had got certain Indian experiences which backfired me on my face while talking to some other audience in New Zealand or for that matter in Portugal because our cultural ethos are our own theirs is very different and unique so as a presenter you should be a little aware about that thought as well so this is all summarizing uh, the basic things which is nothing but you did a 3p analysis you know that people sorry purpose people and place you created a compelling narrative you designed by way of powerpoints or any other material you also factored into what kind of audience interactions will you have and please rehearse 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 because if you are not preparing you are surely preparing for a failure and one thing I strongly believe is this is again the practice of neuro-linguistic programming that I do I find that the meaning of my communication is the response that I get from you it squarely puts the onus and responsibility on me as a presenter giving the right kind of signals and messages to you as a listener you have the hundred percent liberty to interpret the way you feel like so the meaning of my communication is the response that I get and as I spoke about TED they have the finest uh, uh, collections of speeches ever I would like to play one video for you it's of uh, a lady called Nancy Duarte who is regarded as a communication expert and coach and she talks about some of the fundamental elements of great communications or presentations here it is for you
Where is the volume? Volume. It's, it's really, really great to be here. I, you have the power to change the world. I'm not saying that to be cliche. You really have the power to change the world. Deep inside of you, every single one of you has the most powerful device known to man. And that's an idea. So a single idea from the human mind, it can start a groundswell. It could be a flashpoint for a movement. And it can actually rewrite our future. But an idea is powerless if it stays inside of you. If you never pull that idea out for others to contend with, it will die with you. Now, maybe some of you guys have tried to convey your idea, and it wasn't adopted. It was rejected. And some other mediocre or average idea was adopted. And the only difference between those two is in the way it was communicated. Because if you communicate an idea in a way that resonates, change will happen, and you can change the world. So my family, we collect these uh, vintage European posters. Every time we go to Maui, we go to the dealer there. And he turns these great big posters. I love them. They all have one idea and one really clear visual that conveys the idea. They're about the size of a mattress. They're really big. They're not as thick as a mattress, but they're big. And the guy will tell the story as he turns the pages. And this one time, I was flanked by my two kids. And uh, he turns the page, and this poster's underneath. And right when I lean forward and say, oh my god, I love this poster. Both my kids jump back, and they're like, oh my god, mom, it's you. <laughs> it's <the poster. laughs> Yeah, like, fire it up. <laughs> the thing I loved about this poster was the irony. Here's this chick all fired up, headed into battle as the standard bear, and she's holding these little suavitos baking spices. Like something so seemingly insignificant, though she's willing to risk, you know, life and limb to promote this thing. So if you were to swap out, swap out those little suavitos baking spices with a presentation, yeah, it's me, pretty fired up. <laughs> I was fired up about presentations back when it wasn't cool to be fired up about presentations. I really think they have the power to change the world when you communicate effectively through them. And changing the world is hard. It, it won't happen with just one person with one single idea. That idea has got to spread or it won't be effective. So it has to come out of you and out into the open for people to see. And the way that ideas are conveyed the most effectively is through story. You know, for thousands of years, illiterate generations would pass on their values and their culture from generation to generation, and they would stay intact. So there's something kind of magical about a story structure that makes it so that when it's assembled, it can be ingested and then recalled by the person who's receiving it. So basically, a story, you get a physical reaction. Your heart can race, your eyes can dilate. You could talk about, oh, I got a chill down my spine, or I could feel it in the pit of my stomach. We actually physically react when someone's telling us a story. So even though the stage is the same, a story can be told, but once a presentation's told, it completely flatlines. And I wanted to figure out why. Why is it that we physically sit with rapt attention during a story, but it just dies for a presentation? So I wanted to figure out, how do you incorporate story into presentations? So we've had thousands of presentations back at the shop, hundreds of thousands of presentations, actually. So I knew the context of a really bad presentation. And I decided to study cinema and literature and really dig in and figure out what was going on and why it was broken. So I want to show you some of the findings that led up to what I think of, I've uncovered as a presentation form. So it was obvious to start with Aristotle. He had a three-act structure, a beginning, a middle, and an end. We studied poetics and rhetoric. And a lot of presentations don't even have that in its most simple form. And then when I moved on to studying hero archetypes, I thought, oh, OK, the presenter's the hero. They're up on stage. They're the star of the show. And it's really easy to feel that way as the presenter that you're the star of the show. Well, I realized right away that that's really broken. Because I have an idea. I can put it out there. But if you guys don't grab that idea and hold it as dear, the idea goes nowhere, and the world has never changed. So in reality, the presenter isn't the hero. The audience is the hero of our idea. So if you look at Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, just at the front part, there were some really interesting insights there. So there's this likable hero in an ordinary world, and they get this call to adventure. So the world is kind of brought out of balance. And at first, they're resistant. They're like, I don't know if I want to jump into this. And then a mentor comes along and helps them move from their ordinary world into a special world. And that's the role of the presenter, is to be the mentor. You're not Luke Skywalker, you're Yoda. You're the one that actually helps the audience move from one thing and into your new special idea. And that's the power of story. 
So in its most simple structure, it's a three-part structure of a story. You have a likable hero who has a desire, and they encounter a roadblock, and ultimately they emerge transformed, and that's the basic structure. But it wasn't until I came across uh, Gustav Freytag's pyramid. He drew this shape in 1863. Now, he was a German dramatist. If I click. He's a German dramatist, and uh, he believed there was a five-act structure, which has a, a exposition, a rising action, a climax, a falling action, and a denouement, which is the unraveling or, or the resolution of the story. Well, I love the shape. So we talk about shape. Story has an arc. Well, an arc is a shape. We talk about classical music having a shapeliness to it. So I thought, hey, if presentations had a shape, what would that shape be? And, and how do the greatest communicators use that shape, or do they use a shape? So I'll never forget, it was a Saturday morning. After all this study, it was a couple years of study, I drew a shape. And I was like, oh my gosh, if this shape is real, I should be able to take two completely different presentations and overlay it, and it should be true. So I took the obvious, I took Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, and I took Steve Jobs' 2007 iPhone launch speech, I overlaid it over it, and it worked. I sat in my office, just astounded, I actually cried a little, um, because it was like, oh, I've been given this gift, and here it is, this is the shape of a great presentation. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? crying. <laughs> so I want to walk you through it, because it's actually pretty astounding, there is a beginning, a middle, and an end, and I want to walk you through it because the greatest communicators of all time, I went through speeches, everything, actually I can overlay the shape. Even the Gettysburg Address um, follows the shape. So at the beginning of any presentation, you need to establish what is. You know, here's the status quo, here's what's going on. And then you need to compare that to what could be. Now you need to make that gap as big as possible because there's the, the commonplace of the status quo and you need to contrast that with the loftiness of your idea. So it's like, you know, here's the past, here's the present, but look at our future. Here's a problem, but look at that problem removed. Here's a roadblock. Let's annihilate the roadblock. You need to really amplify that gap. This would be like the inciting incident in a movie. It's when suddenly the audience has to contend with what you just put out there, and they have to say, wow, do I want to agree with this and align with it or not? And then the rest of your presentation should support that. So the middle goes back and forth. It traverses between what is and what could be, what is and what could be. Because what you're trying to do is make the status quo and the normal unappealing. And you're wanting to draw them towards what could be in the future with your idea adopted. Now, on your way to change the world, people are going to resist. They're not going to be excited. They may love the world the way it is. So you'll encounter resistance. That's why you have to move back and forth. It's similar to sailing. When you're sailing and against the wind and there is wind resistance, you have to move your boat back and forth and back and forth. That's so you can capture the wind. You have to actually capture the resistance coming against you when you're sailing. Now, interesting, if you capture the wind just right and you set your sail just right, your ship will actually sail faster than the wind itself. It's a physics phenomenon. So by planting in there the way they're going to resist between what is and what can be, it's actually going to draw them towards your idea quicker than should you not do that. So after you've moved back and forth between what is and what could be, the last turning point is a call to action, which every presentation should have. But at the very end, you need to describe the world as a new bliss. This is utopia with my idea adopted. This is the way the world is going to look when we join together and we solve this big problem. So you need to use that as your ending in a very poetic and a dramatic way. So, interestingly, when I was done, I was like, you know what? I could use this as an analysis tool. I actually transcribed speeches, and I would actually map out how much they mapped to this tool. So I want to show you some of that today, and I want to start with the very two people that I used when I first did. Here's Mr. Jobs, completely has changed the world, changed the world of personal computing, he's changed the music industry, now he's on his way to change the device, the mobile device industry, so he's definitely changed the world. And this is the shape of his iPhone launch, 2007, when he launched his iPhone. It's a 90-minute talk, and you can see he starts with what is, traverses back and forth, and ends with what could be. So I want to zoom in on this. The white line is him speaking. He's just talking. Uh, the next color line you'll see popped up there, that's when he cuts to video, so he's adding some variety and he cuts to demo. So it's not just him talking the whole time. And these lines are um, representative there. And then towards the end you'll see a blue line which will be the guest speaker. So, this is where it gets kind of interesting. Every tick mark here is when he made them laugh. And every tick mark here is when he made them clap. They are so involved physically. They are physically reacting to what he is saying, which is actually fantastic, because then you know you have the audience like, in your hand. So he kicks off 
what it, what could be. With this as a day I have been looking forward to for two and a half years. So he's launching a product that he's known about already for a couple years. So this is not a new product to him. But look at this. He does this other thing. He marvels. He marvels at his own product. He marvels himself more than the audience laughs or claps. So he's like, isn't it awesome? Isn't this beautiful? And he's modeling for the audience what he wants them to feel. So he is actually doing a job of compelling them to feel a certain way. So he kicks off with what could be, with every once in a while, a revolutionary product comes along that changes everything. So he starts to kick in and talk about his new product. Now at the beginning of it, he actually keeps the phone off. You'll see that the line is pretty white up until this point. So he goes off between, here's this new phone, and here's the sucky competitors, and here's this new phone, and here's the sucky competitors. And then, right about here, he has a star moment, and that's something we'll always remember. What he does, he turns the phone on. The audience sees scrolling for the first time, and you can hear the oxygen suck down the room. They gasped. You can actually hear it. So it creates a moment that they'll always remember. So if we move along this model, you can see the blue where the external speakers are going, and then over towards the bottom right, the line breaks. That's because his clicker broke. So what does he do? He wants to keep this heightened sense of excitement. He tells a personal story right there where the technology didn't work. So he was the master communicator, and he turns to story to keep the audience involved. So the top right, he ends with the new bliss. He, he leaves them with a promise that Apple will continue to build revolutionary new products. And he says, there's an old Wayne Gretzky quote that I love. I skate to where the puck is going to be, not to where it's been. We've always tried to do that at Apple from the very, very beginning, and we always will. So he ends with the new bliss. So let's look at Mr. King. He was an amazing visionary. He's a clergyman who spent his life working hard for equality. And this is the shape of the I Have a Dream speech. You can see he starts with what is, moves back and forth between what is and what could be, and ends with a very poetic new bliss, which is the famous part that we all know. So I'm going to spread it out a little bit here, stretch it for you. And what I'm doing here is I've put the actual transcript there along with the text. I know you can't read it. But at the end of every line break, I broke the line there because he took a breath and he paused. Now, he was a Southern Baptist preacher. Most people hadn't heard that. So he had a real cadence and a rhythm that was really new for the people there. So I want to cover up these lines of text with a bar, because I want to use this bar as an information device here. So let's walk through how he actually spoke to the people. The blue bars here are going to be when he used the actual rhetorical device of repetition. So he was repeating himself. He was using the same words and phrases as, so people could remember and recall them. Well, then he also used a lot of metaphors and visual words. This was a way to take really complicated ideas and make them memorable and knowledgeable so people got it. He actually created very, almost like scenes with his words to make it so they could envision what he was saying. And then there was also a lot of familiar songs and scriptures that he used. This is just the front end of it that you're seeing. And then he also made a lot of political references of the promises that were made to the people. So if we look at the very first end of what is, at the very end of what is was the very first time that people actually clapped and roared really loud. So at the end of what is, what he did is he said, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. Well, everyone knows what it's like to not have money in your account. So he used a metaphor people were very familiar with. But when they really charged up, the very first time they really, really screamed, was, so we have come to cash this check, a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice. And that's when they really clap. It was when he compared what currently is to what could be. So when we move along a little farther in the model, you'll see it goes back and forth at a more frenzied pace. And this is when he goes back and forth and back and forth. Now, the audience was in a frenzy. You know, they were all excited. And so you can actually do this to keep them in a heightened sense of excitement. So he says, I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. So you can see a little orange text there to remind him of the promise that the politicians had made to him or that this country had made. Then he moves back and forth between I have a dream that one day, I have a dream that one day, I have a dream that one day. And then at the end, it gets really interesting here because he uses, you can look at the four shades of green. There's a lot of blue there, which was a lot of repetition. He had a heightened sense of repetition. And the green was a heightened sense of songs and scriptures. So we, the first batch of green was the actual scripture from the book of Isaiah. The second batch of green was My Country, Tis of Thee. Now that's a familiar song that was specifically very significant for the black people at the time because this song was the song they chose to change the words to as an outcry, saying the promises had not been kept. 
So the third batch of green was actually a stanza from my country, Tis of Thee. And then the fourth was the a Negro spiritual, uh, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. So what he did is he actually reached inside of the hearts of the audience. He pulled from scripture, which was important. He pulled from songs that they'd sung together as an outcry against this outrage. And he used those as a device to connect and resonate with the audience ending, painting a picture of this new bliss using the very things inside of them that they already held as sacred. So he's a great man. He had a big, big dream. And there's a lot of people here, you guys have really big dreams. You have really big ideas inside of you that you need to get out. But you know what? We, we encounter hardships. It's not... So essentially, this video talks about uh, what are the components of effective storytelling? How do you appeal to the hearts and minds of people? Uh, what are those powerful anchors for your audience to take home your message from? So, possibly, uh, these are some of the other resources. You might be knowing about Toastmaster clubs. Uh, these are basically global organizations who actually train people on basic communication skills. And various organizations do have their own Toastmasters club. So, in earlier days, it has got an interesting story behind it. Uh, Still, we raise toast. Uh, I mean, that's how the Western world looks at celebrations, raising a toast about some success or victory, right? But in earlier times, it was, I'm talking of some 1700, uh, I mean, AD. Uh, raising a toast always needed you to make a short speech about what you have achieved in your life for which they are celebrating. So the person who is raising the toast actually was needed to make a short speech. And most often they're not, as you expect. They fumble while making those speeches. And that's the genesis of this Toastmasters Club. They started a group of people who would in turn teach people how to make short, uh, impromptu, extempore kind of thing. So that's the genesis of Toastmasters, which still continues. And it's a very respectable organization globally. And it's a very good tool if you have, if some of you would like to be part of it in cities such as yours, in Bangalore, in Chennai, and other parts of the country, uh, uh, towns, you have got your own city-based Toastmasters Club. And I, I know for sure there are many medical professionals who are part actively of Toastmasters Club. And they swear by the effectiveness they have received through their improved presentations and communication skills. A couple of more books. Uh, and uh, resources, but definitely this is one I will strongly recommend you to keep on looking for some of the tips, trivia, and tricks for effective presentations. Uh, that was all about some of the techniques. Uh, I will also take you through some basic PowerPoint techniques because at the end of the day, PowerPoint still is the most widely held tool for making presentations. So there's no wrong in the tool, by the way. So the way we use it makes uh, or breaks its effectiveness kind of thing. So yes, we will look into those. If you are interested to get some of the tips in making the PowerPoint slides, I'm surely available to talk on that matter as well. But this uh, workshop was not to run a PowerPoint workshop. That's the reason I'm not specifically touching on that too. But if you are interested, definitely I will be more than willing to share. Uh, one of the tri trips that I would like and encourage you to, because some of the uh, you effectively made use of certain cartoon strips, uh, your own colleague uh, making those nice, uh, uh, Dr. Chaudhary you talked about, yes? Uh, why do you understand? Uh, because more often than not, we felt connected with those uh, visuals whenever you presented. Because it's a known fact that a picture communicates or says thousand words. But how effectively use your pictures, that itself is a trick. Because if you have put up, say, six pictures on a single slide, you have communicated 6,000 words. But the audience mind is limited capacity and bandwidth. It can't possibly process those many. So how do you effectively use those visuals itself is a tricky art. What kind of color combination? You talked about uh, light background with uh, bold colors and vice versa. Those are some of the effective techniques. Uh, to do that. 
A couple of guiding things that I can immediately suggest to you is don't make more than five sentences or lines. Sentences are completely no-no. If you write a whole scripture and sentence on a slide, it's a complete no-no, red zone. But if you really need to make some presentations, please chunk them into different slides, but no slide should have more than five lines as a rule of thumb. If you have got those five or six lines which you invariably need to put on a slide, better you might wish to think of animating those one after another and stuff like that, instead of showing all six at a single go. What happens, my mind starts scanning all those six lines and in the process, I get my focus and attention diluted where you want me to. And hence, animations are interesting things to bring into elements. So these are some of those scripts and trivia we can always talk one on one. Yes, I'm done with my bit of uh, presentation for the day. I will rest here and allow all of you to receive your recording, uh, which I think all of you have been given already, the recordings. So these are uh, with you. For next 30 minutes, uh, you might wish to have a review of your own presentation in the laptops. Those of you who don't have, may I just request you to get two laptops for, uh, for them. And uh, you play those, review those presentations and based on the learning and the feedback that you received since morning and through this presentation, you'd like to make some amendments and change in next 30 minutes. Once we are done, at 1.30 we break for lunch and post lunch we come back and start giving the same very presentation which has been modified now by this 30 minutes. One more time. Is that fine? Yeah? Thank you so very much. Yeah?